Hi everyone, I'm Zoe. I'm a technical program manager from Google. Today, I will be talking about machine learning on mobile devices. I will provide an overview of on-device machine learning, walk through some interesting examples, and work together with you on an Android app that uses a Gen AI model to create images. First, I will provide some background about on-device machine learning. Here, listed a few advantages of on-device machine learning. Before diving into that, it might be helpful to understand a bit about how machine learning models run on devices and what's the difference between serving from device and servers. Take hand gesture recognition as an example. To run a machine learning model on servers, your device camera first captures your gesture, and then your gesture will be sent to a data center where the machine learning model is hosted and the machines there will process your gesture and return the detection result back to your device. And this is server-side machine learning because models are hosted on servers. For on-device machine learning, the models are hosted locally on your device. For example, the hand gesture recognition model can be pre-downloaded to your mobile. And then when you make a model inference call, it invokes your machine learning model from your device directly. And this is how on-device machine learning can provide the benefits mentioned in this slide. First, about privacy. By processing data locally, on-device machine learning empowers users with complete control over their information. This eliminates the risk of data breaches or unauthorized access that can occur during cloud transmissions. And also, it provides some enhanced security, for example, Sensitive data like facial scars or audio recordings never leave the device, minimizing the potential of misuse and ensuring compliance with our strict privacy regulations. Secondly, reduced latency. On-device ML eliminates the need to send data back and forth to the cloud. This leads to significant reductions in cloud transmission latency. This also enables real-time responses and seamless user experiences. Consider a mobile app that uses facial recognition to unblock your phone. On-device ML ensures instant recognition, and this reduces the delay associated with cloud transmission and making unblocking your phone faster and more convenient. Besides, it also works offline with uninterrupted functionality. For example, on-device ML allows applications to function even when an internet connection is not available at that time. This empowers users with continuous access to essential features and services regardless of their location. Imagine a translation application that helps you navigate a foreign country. With on-device machine learning, you can translate languages instantly on your phone even without an internet connection as long as you download the model to your phone. This ensures a smooth communication during your travels. Lastly, about cost efficiency. On-device ML leverages existing device resources, and this reduces the need for expensive cloud infrastructure and minimizes the overall operational cost for developers and businesses. This workshop will be mainly focused on on-device machine learning on mobiles. However, on-device ML isn't limited to a single device type. It's flourishing across a wide variety of edge devices, each offering unique opportunities. Starting with smartphones and tablets, with their growing processing power and advanced chips, they become ideal platforms for personalized experiences. Google is bringing Gemini to Pixel. Pixel 8 Pro is the first smartphone engineered to run Gemini Nano, which is empowering new features like Summarize in the Recorder app and also some spot reply in Gboard, starting to be rolling up in WhatsApp. Besides mobiles, we could also run ML mobiles on web browser. This can be accelerated with WebGPU and other technologies. Consider a browser-based translation tool that allows you to translate text on the web page in real time directly within your browser. This tool utilizes on-device ML capabilities, enabling seamless translation even when offline, because the model is just there in your browser. Lastly, we can even deploy ML models to some microcontrollers. For example, improved machine learning algorithm brings over innovation to Fitbit and Pixel Watch. 
heart rate tracking during vigorous activities is more accurate than before due to on-device ML. While the benefits of on-device machine learning are undeniable, there are also some inherent challenges that come with running complex algorithms on those resource constraints devices. Here, we'll talk about three hurdles and some potential solutions. Starting with limited hardware compatibilities, like integrated on mobile devices, the mobile computation power and memory are less powerful than servers. Therefore, it requires framework providers like TensorFlow Lite to design an efficient runtime that fits into the hardware constraints, but still runs performantly. Features include like asynchronous execution and hardware acceleration and interrupt. Besides hardware limitations, model size and compatibility is also pretty critical here. Large language models unblock many capabilities, but also at the cost of model size increase. To fit into model storage, we could apply model optimization and quantization technology to shrink the model size. For example, by quantizing model weights from flow 32 to flow 16, we instantly get a model size that's two times smaller. Lastly, about heterogeneity. As you know, Android has a vibrant ecosystem with a wide variety of devices, each with different hardware and software capabilities. To be able to adapt to that, on-device solutions need to be deployable on edge CPU, GPU, and other chips. Here, I will show you some interesting examples of running machine learning models on mobile devices. You can find these demos on tensorflow.org website. The code is all open source on GitHub. Feel free to download it yourself and play with it. The first example I'm showing here is a task completion task on an Android app. We provide a code lab to run a Keras model on device. The original ML model comes from Keras NLP, which is a library that contains state-of-art pre-trained models for natural language processing tasks and can support users through their entire development cycle. You can see the list of models available in the Keras NLP repository on GitHub. Their workflows are built from modular components that have the state-of-art preset ways and architectures when used out of box. In this example, we provide a detailed tutorial on how to turn a Keras model to a TensorFlow Lite model and how to perform quantization techniques to it. And then you can also integrate it into an Android app. We open source that Android app as well so that you can substitute the model there with other models as your preference. Okay, in this example, we show another type of ML models that use reinforcement learning algorithm. Reinforcement learning is well known for its capabilities in games and applications that try to optimize for a reward. For example, AlphaZero released by Google DeepMind that plays Go is a type of reinforcement learning model. In this demo, we deploy an agent to mobile devices that can play a game called Plague Strike. Human players can compete with the RL agent in this game. During the actual gameplay in the Android app, when it's the agent's turn to take action, the agent looks at human players' bot state that contains information about previous successful and unsuccessful strikes and then use that to predict where the next track will be. Feel free to check that out on TensorFlow website and test it yourself to see if you can win this agent. The last example I'm showing here is an image generator application that uses a diffusion model. We will dive deeper into some code examples later to see how this is implemented. Before that, I would love to talk a little bit about some background on diffusion models. Image generation is modeled as an iterative denoising process, starting from a noise image, as you can see on the right side. At each step, the diffusion model gradually denoises the image to reveal an image of the target concept. Research shows that leveraging language understanding through text prompts can greatly improve image generation. To do that, the text embedding is usually connected to the model through cross-attention layers so that the text information is passed through. With that, I think it's time to try it yourself following some tutorials here. This collab provides 
uh, this collab provides some basic information of how to run a basic text-to-image generation. The workshop is written by Paul Ruiz. This application is powered by a diffusion-based model exposed through MediaPipe solutions. Before we get into all the fun and exciting parts of this new MediaPipe task, I'd love to mention that our image generation API supports any models that exactly match the stable diffusion version 1.5 architecture. And you can use a pre-trained model or your fine-tuned models by converting it into a model format supported by MediaPipe image generator. We have already provided a conversion script. You can check out our MediaPipe website and play with yourself. And here, we are going to walk through some collab. And this is some prerequisites to run through the tutorial by yourself. First, you will need to install an Android Studio. This tutorial was written and tested with Android Studio Giraffe version. Next, if you want to run the application on an actual mobile device rather than a simulator in Android Studio, we recommend you use an Android device with at least 8 gigabytes of RAM because Gen AI models are computational intensive. Also, some basic knowledge of Android development might be very helpful here. This will help you easily follow through this tutorial to deploy an Android app. We have provided this code skeleton on GitHub. You can find it under Google samples slash media pipe repo. Now I'm going to briefly introduce some key functions in this code example starting with the library we are using. You can go ahead and this, add this dependency to your Gradle file. This is a media pipe task library that exposes easy to use Java APIs that you can integrate with your own apps. Next, you'll navigate into a file called image generation helper function. This file does all the heavy lifting in our image generation application. You'll start off by setting up the options for your image generator object. Here, we'll show you how to set up a model path. You will populate the model path in later steps. An optional parameter here is LoRaWidth. If you go to Google Vertex AI Model Garden, you'll find detailed instructions on how to train a set of LoRaWidths. These weights can further be plugged into the options here. For this example, we will start with some basic and uh, default weights from the model that you download later on. After you finish configuration options, you can initialize an image generator object using create from options function. This way, you will create an image generator object that will be used later on. A next step is to configure the inputs. Below, you will see another function called setInput. The purpose of this function is to set these initial parameters for the image generator when you attempt to create an image that displays intermediate steps. This function accepts three parameters, prompt, iteration, and seed. For prompt, this is a string that will be used to define the generated image. And iteration is the number of iterations that the task will go through while generating the new image. A seed is a value that can be used to create new versions of image based on the same prompt. You will generate the same image if the same seed is used. This can help you test your models and reproduce the same results. OK, the next step is where all the generation takes place. The generate function accepts the same inputs as set input function that we saw previously, but also creates an image as in one shot call that does not return any intermediate step images. It's important to know that this task happens synchronously. You'll need to call this function from a background thread. You'll learn this a little bit later in this collab as well. Once the generate function returns a result, we will use the helper function to extract the bitmap from the result. OK, this is the last step under the helper object. Similarly to the previous step, this step also does image generation function. However, here we are using the execute function that takes in a Boolean value. This Boolean value tells if it should return the intermediate image or not. And for a single step of generation, the uh, function will perform using the execute function. 
this will be the final step before we're going into the next slide. OK, um, now we can navigate to the main view model. And this file will do all the assembling and bring all the app all together. The main view model file will handle UI states and other logics related to the example app. Towards the top of the file, you'll find some comments, and that marks the start of step six. This is where you will tell your app where it can find the model files that are necessary for image generation. For this example, you will set the value to this location. You will need to go to the MediaPipe image generation website and download the model file. There are a variety of model files we provide there, and you can also use LoRaWiz that we mentioned before to fine tune your model. And from there, if you scroll down to the generate image function, towards the bottom of this function, you'll see both step six, uh, step seven, and step eight. This will be used to generate images with either returned iterations or none, respectively. As both of these operations happen synchronously, you'll notice that they are wrapped in a code routine. This slide shows the code example of generating the image without showing iterations. We will be calling the generate function that we defined previously in the helper class. This will run synchronously and return you with a final result. Then you'll copy the result to the output bitmap and update the UI state. And this way, you can see that in your Android app. OK, the next code block allows you to generate images with showing intermediate interactions. Here, the generation is wrapped inside a while loop that loops through the configured iteration. For example, if you set the iteration to a default value of 20, the code block will be looped and executed 20 iterations to generate a desired output image. The display iteration here means after how many iterations we should show an intermediate result. If you set the value of display iteration to 5, it means that for every 5 iterations, we will show the current output image. With a total of 20 iterations, we will display 4 images during the execution. Then, if the app detects that the current iteration needs to display an image, an update to the UI state will be triggered so that users will be able to see an updated image on the UI. Here, we are also outputting some messages to help us debug and navigate through different states. By now, I think you have completed all the required code in this CoLab tutorial. Remember to download the diffusion models from the MediaPipe image generation website so that you can deploy and run the models by yourself. You can hit the green button in Android Studio and start testing it out. With that, this concludes this workshop on on-device machine learning. I'm going to hand over to the next speaker. Hopefully, you can enjoy the rest of the talks. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.